All right. Hello, I'm Andrei, and uh, I guess we'll be switching gears a little bit to more everyday topic, I guess. <laughs> so I, I'm going to talk about trusted and privileged DTF, right? Uh, and trusted is the important part here because uh, I don't think we, I guess as a community, we made a decision that unprivileged BPF, like unqualified unprivileged BPF is not a future for BPF because we just cannot really like trust enough that we can prevent any possible misuse and all that stuff, right? So uh, the only option I think is like to allow unprivileged, but only once you verify that the use case, the application that you run is actually through some form, right? Like through code reviewing, production infrastructure is trusted and like is sort of like the one that you know about, right? But getting kind of like a half step back, uh, how the BPF is typically used today, right? Like typically you need to, be to have either root or root-like capabilities. Uh, specifically, you have cap BPF combined with either perfmon or net admin or both, depending on like which kind of programs you are running. Like tracing usually needs perfmon, anything network related net admin. If you have network related that is doing tracing, then you need all of them basically. And then like even in addition to all of that, uh, sometimes you need cap sys admin, uh, which is basically root. Uh, to do operations like translating ID to file descriptor to get some file inform uh, object information and stuff like this. And I mean, it works today, right? But uh, it's pretty coarse grained. You don't have that much granularity in like who can do what. Like you either grant those permissions uh, or not. And like if you grant them, like you can basically do way more than just uh, using BPF, uh, which is obviously a downside, right? And as I mentioned before, the vanilla unprivileged BPF, and I'm making up my terminology here, but like just unqualified unprivileged BPF, the process without any of those capabilities, just too dangerous and impractical to enable using like lots of modern BPF features, right? Having said that, right, in production, it's still very desirable to not give root permissions to your applications just to be able to use useful, well-known, sort of reviewed and trusted BPF uh, functionality. So how can we change that? And uh, the underlying problem is that we do check the real uh, capabilities, right? That means that we check them that you have them in init namespace. Uh, I guess I'll jump through half of the slide. Why do we do that? Because BPF just by sort of like a definition is not something that you can send box to a C group or a single process or anything like this. Uh, due to us having BPF pro breed, kernel BPF pro breed user and lots of other different things, you cannot really contain a uh, BPF program from like looking only at kernel objects that belong to a given C group, container process, or like user space memory just from like process one, two, three, right? Uh, so inherently like the cap BPF and like by definition also like the combination of BPF and perf1 and net admin, it's just like not compatible with user namespaces. Uh, so just wanted to answer the question that I often get asked, not I, just like in general, this is brought up like very frequently. Why can't we just namespace cap BPF? Well, we cannot because we cannot guarantee the uh, sandboxing, right? So instead of like pretending and actually you know, letting programs like snoop on some processes they are not intended to snoop on. We just say like, no, sorry, in general, this is not possible. Um, so we did few, we, we had few attempts to uh, allow sort of unprivileged uh, BPF use cases. Like one of them was few years ago by Song. It was called, uh, codenamed Dev BPF. Uh, and I'll, I'll just give you like a, brief overview, what, what was the kind of the big idea? The big idea was that we had a device, dev BPF, which would sort of re represent uh, ability to do something with BPF uh, system, right? If your process uh, was allowed to open this file and get like its uh, file descriptor, you could use some special IOCTL to, to basically set a persistent bit on current task, on, on current thread, which would say that like all subsequent BPF calls until like you disable this, obviously, 
I allowed to do BPF, right? So we would say, set like BPF permitted uh, Boolean flag on current uh, task, and then if you do subsequent BPF sys calls, no matter what the command, I think, uh, the internal BPF code would check if this bit is set, and if yes, then like we would basically just allow uh, to do like perf b perform BPF operation regardless of like the capabilities, root permissions, and stuff like this. This was rejected by upstream, uh, and from my reading of the very long thread from back then, uh, I think the biggest problem was not so much the like the dev BPF representing ability to do something with the BPF uh, system, and more like this persistent bit on the task. Uh, it was also brought up that like this is kind of fundamentally incompatible with uh, runtimes like Go, where uh, like user visible thread is not the same as kernel thread, and like you you have like as a user you have no control of how is that migrated, so that would cause like even more issues. So what happened after that, like eventually we ended up with the current schema where we have cap, like we, we split out like sysadmin uh, into uh, cap BPF, perf1 and netadmin, and that's what we have today. Uh, but that that's not enough because of, as I mentioned before, in like fundamental incompatibility with user namespaces and general like not enough flexibility and granularity. So recently we did another attempt to rectify that and that attempt was using authoritative LSM approach. And sort of like high level idea was we added a few, uh, few new BP, uh, LSM hooks uh, in BPF syscall and uh, the semantics of those hooks were that they could both reject as like all the other LSM hooks do, uh, but also it could grant permissions to uh, to use BPF functionality, like BPF prog load, BPF uh, map, map create, uh, stuff like this. Well, it turns out that this kind of brings back like 20 year old debate about restrictive LSM and authoritative LSM and uh, LSM maintainers were like very clear about like, no, we are not adding authoritative LSM. So this, this whole approach had to be scrapped, uh, unfortunately. But maybe the third time will be a charm. Uh, I, I went back to the original DevBPF discussion and tried to take good parts of it and drop the bad parts and like try to like slightly change it to allow basically the same idea that like some file, you can create like open some file which would basically grant you permissions to do some functionality, uh, some BPF functionality. So. The f FD idea, I think, was good, and like talking with a bunch of security-related folks, that seems to make sense to them as well. The IOCTL and the persistent bit on the task track was definitely bad, and it was one of the reasons why it was rejected, so like, no go for that. Uh, I've also been told that using dev character device files is kind of error-prone and like not great. Uh, and we can talk about that later why, I guess. Uh, but generally speaking, like anything that it looks like real file and can be like copied and stuff like this is it's just error prone and like can be misused unintentionally in production. So uh, ideally we avoid real files and just like stay to like anonymous I know virtual files. But besides of that, like uh, we can still use LSM on top as long as it's restricted, right? So LSM can provide this extra layer of like super dynamic and very fine grained uh, restrictive layer. So like even if like whatever mechanism you provide to like allow some functionality in BPF, you can still like build LSM on top to, to kind of restrict it to only like specific conditions and specific use cases. So I call this, this whole approach BPF token because uh, it seems like that's the uh, terminology that's used by like o OAuth framework, open uh, authentication, like to, to kind of generate permissions, grant permissions, and then like transfer them and prove them and all that stuff. So basically token seems to make sense as a terminology, but if someone has better idea, I'm open to it. But basically the big idea is we add a new BPF syscall command, BPF token create. That thing, if you have right capabilities, right permissions, will create an anonymous file, basically, right? It will give you file descriptor. And for starters, I think like we should require capsys admin because the, the idea of this FD is like it basically grants you like the same permissions that capsys admin if you had them. But once you have this token FD, other existing commands like program load, uh, map create, 
like all the operations to get file descriptor by ID would accept this token FD as an optional attribute. And if that FD actually represents BPF token and like that token allows you to perform that operation, then you as an unprivileged process would be allowed to do BPF functionality that normally is reserved to root. Because the kind of the, the big idea is that someone is, someone with permissions granted you like ability to use BPF subsystem, so they trust you and like you, you kind of have this token FD as a, as a proof of that. Um, so, how, how kind of like the flow works, right? Like you have some real root uh, process or at least the process with like cap BPF, cap FFmon in, in it and the namespace. That thing creates the token and then it transfer it to, uh, to unprivileged process that like it verified that it's trusted, validated, signed, whatever, right? One way to do, to do the transfer is like the existing Unix domain socket mechanism with SCM rights, but that's, I mean, it's doable, but it's probably not that convenient in practice. Not every, not every like framework supports it and all this stuff. But we can use the existing idea of BPFFS pinning, right? Same way as we pin BPF map program and uh, BTF link, we can start pinning this token file. This, this allows you to just expose it as a, like a normal file within the file system, within BPF file system. Uh, you can change owner, change uh, access mode, and uh, basically control it using the normal file permissions. Uh, the SysFS itself, you can control using the mount namespaces, mounting, unmounting, like as necessary within the container, stuff like this. But eventually, the idea is that unprivileged process should be able to open this file using BPF object get mechanism that we, uh, we do for, for any other BPF uh, object. And once that succeeds, then they get like the token FD that uh, they can use later for all the BPF uh, operations. And as I said before, LSM still plays a role here if you want it, uh, because BPF LSM can kind of dictate like who can open token, even if that token is like accessible through file permissions, you can still reject them if you detect that some, some process is like un, untrustworthy. Um, from, from kind of like the implementation BPF specific approach, uh, I think it's, it's pretty good because it reuses the BPF syscall. We use this extensible mechanism with BPF Ather union. Uh, so while initially I would like to just do it as a like all or nothing thing. Like if you can create token, it gives you basically all the, like access to all the operations of the BPF syscall, just like capsys admin. Uh, eventually I think we can fine tune it to, uh, to be able to specify what kind, like what type of programs, for example, you can uh, load, right? Like which, which uh, kinds of BPF hooks you can attach. In addition to that, I remember from, from last year, I think John uh, uh, had like this request, like we can even use this token to fine tune some of the kind of fundam like currently fundamental constants and parameters of the verifier, like the instruction limit and wh whatever, right? But uh, didn't want to do it from the very beginning just to avoid a lot of discussion and bike shedding on like how exactly we do this and what exactly we do this. So, uh, I hope that like all or nothing will be the first step and we have like all the extensibility of, of the union BPF adder uh, to kind of discuss it based on the real world uh, experience and feedback. So some of the other aspects that seems to be good to do from the very beginning would be to allow whoever is creating token to specify some relatively large buffer, which will be like black box to the BPF subsystem. It will be just passed through to the, uh, kernel structure which will be visible to BPF programs, right? Like BPF LSM programs, for example. Just some sort of uh, user context to, to be used as like a additional config on at runtime, like what you can do with, with the application that is using this token. And in that sense, token becomes a representation of the use case, right? And like you, whoever is creating use case can specify like what the security policy can, can or should enforce later on. Uh, so yeah, in that sense, while the original dev BPF idea was mostly like the singleton file, like with token, I think it would be more powerful and flexible to allow multiple of those and potentially have like different token for each container, different use case. 
Um, so, so one, one question, yeah. like how would this work in practice? So you would basically have like a daemon and then this daemon would pin up on request somehow like those tokens into the BPF file system and then applications should be able to yes, read them out? Yes, yeah. so something with root permission. So like for example, like uh, at Meta we have Tupperware, right? Like which is our container store. It has Tupperware agent which spins up like new containers, sets them up like through system D interaction. I don't know like all the details, but basically there is like this privileged daemon that like sets everything up, downloads images and all this stuff. So the way that I see this, this uh, Tupperware agent would, would know that like this specific use case service, right? Is allowed to use BPF. Right, so then, like, when setting up the container, they will mount CSFS in like well-known location or something like this, and just pin this token file, and then like all the uh, like normal and privileged processes inside, they will just know where to expect this uh, token. They will open them and like pass to the BPF syscall, and I think like similar idea probably can be done with System D, like for you know for like just generic open source solution. So the, the you said that in the beginning you said you kind of don't want, I guess you don't want Tupperware to give programs root per se. That's kind of the initial motivation for well, this. Well, both we don't and we cannot. Maybe I, okay. I probably messed up that part. The cap BPF that like we require, like real cap BPF in Internet namespace, they are fundamentally incompatible with user namespace. And like at least Meta is trying to move towards containers using the user namespace for like better isolation, all this okay. stuff. And like that just leaves us like with no technical ability to even grant ability to use BPF inside those containers. Okay, so there is a user namespace in play. You start your program in that user namespace and you want to give it the ability to do some BPF, BPF things, yeah. cap BPF things. Yeah. Okay. And in that instance you there's no mechanism in the kernel to start it with like the global cap BPF, because the way I understand it, this token would still be like global cap BPF, right? You can still go and read others' processes' memories if you wished, yeah. right? Yes. So there's yeah. no semantic difference, but like uh, I think I'm missing like a little bit where what you're trying to achieve is not possible with cap BPF at the moment. That's probably just because I'm, I don't understand how the system works enough. So which bit are you confused? Like why we cannot achieve it with cap BPF right now? Yeah, so so like the combination of cap BPF and, and user namespace. Understand that like the in the kernel the check is kind of it's kind of the wrong kind of check. So you always check the the capability in the root namespace or right. something like that. Is that where it comes from? Or yes, yeah. I so I like it's, it's hard coded basically. in the in the kernel that like when you do capable cap BPF, and you are actually running in user namespace, then like it j just fails. That's okay. You never so get to like checking. Did this process have cap BPF granted in initial? namespace, like right. you don't get there. So the user namespace, it has maybe cap BPF, but then the check still fails in kernel because it doesn't have individual namespace. And there's no way to giving it cap BPF yes. in the root namespace because yes. yes. okay, I and see. And to, to your question, why, like, so, uh, sorry to jump in, so to extrapolate on this. <laughs> so like sure. initially, actually, when we added cap BPF, it thought like we will figure it out and that I guess we misunderstood, I misunderstood how user in a space is supposed to work. So set the user ID like real, so there is no real root inside user in S. Once you're inside user in S, you can never become a sysadmin or root in the need. So just no way whatsoever to escape it. So that's an escape clause. So once you start anything user in S, whatever root it is, you cannot use BPF at all. And there is no mechanism currently, none. Yeah, and the second part I mean of the, the question was... Yes, uh, I think the only way is to start the container as like privileged, right? And then you basically lose everything. You have to give it everything or you just, uh, or there's no way. You uh, Either you give all the privileges or it's root equivalent or like there is no NS capable cap BPF and it's not possible. Yes, so once you start the container with, with user NS, that's it, like you cannot, well, you either start with user NS or without. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so right now, like, we, we can run BPF in container only if that container doesn't use user namespace, but we actually mo want to migrate everyone. By design, you can't have, like, you couldn't have a container that has a user namespace, and then it has a capability in the host namespace. That's not possible, like, by design. 
Yeah, and just to answer like the second part, right? Like, h how do we know that like we can grant this token? That that's basically the part where like the trust is, and I don't define what is like trustworthy program because it will depend on like production, right? Like at Meta, we can have some settings, some config that like this container is trusted to do BPF, and then like this this agent will mount extra token inside the container, right? While for others, like we know that they are not supposed to use BPF, so there will be no token. So then, even if they try, they will fail. And like in some other environment, like it will be based on signing or based on whatever, right? Like it's it's separate orthogonal to the mechanism itself. Yeah, sounds really interesting. And I think it's uh, as you said, it's like I like it much better than the the def uh, the BPF token initially with the kind of the the very fixed semantics. This seems really nice. Um, since we're talking about username spaces, what is what is it going to look like with mount namespaces and like this BPFFS? That's currently like in a in a gray zone i think in terms of like if you have a container that's set up does it get the host uh, fsbpf or a completely new one or so as far as i understand and someone can you know correct me i think like each sysfs instance is like independent so you can have like each container having their own sysfs right so you don't have to share anything okay uh, uh, so the, the bpf, BPF yes, sorry, yeah. yeah okay so I had one one question like would this also cover like the retrieving something by the ID for example map ID prog FD or token ID potentially because like then you would kind of break the the namespacing again right like for example like if you give this well it's a, it's a trusted process in the end but if you give it the capability it like in its container it will also be able to access the file descriptor from outside, potentially tokens even. And it might be desirable, actually. Like, maybe they share the map, right? Uh, so, yes, that's what I want to start with. Just like, as I said, all or nothing. So, to grant the token, to create the token, you need to have capsis admin, right? If you have capsis admin, you can do all of that, right? Uh, but then eventually, we should probably, like, lock it down. And, uh, like, with spinning, you know, like, we have this, this like, kind of a bug with maps, right? Like, where you can, like, pin it as a read-only and then open as read-write, right? So I don't want to go there uh, initially, but like eventually we need to fix all that. And then I think we can dictate also that uh, if you have token that was open as read-only, then you can do only like read-only operations, right? Like query information, stuff like this, but you cannot do anything destructive with that program or map or whatever, right? Um, uh, but uh, sec second step, sorry. Uh, just a clarification. Uh, so you give the token to, uh, I guess, a user namespace, for example, and then that user namespace can load any BPF program currently. Yes. Well, that that's where we want to start, right? Like, I don't want to solve like over-engineer this from from the very beginning before we start applying this in practice and seeing like what actually makes sense. We can like add like filters or what kind of programs and what are the ideas of the sure. maps and stuff like this, but that will be probably. It feels to me sense. like what you really want, it's not a, it's not a nothing at all approach because it, it, I, I don't know, it currently makes it pretty useless, I would say. What you really want is uh, to, to allow list per program, right, ideally, per load, basically. Uh, load and attach. Christian, you can, you can probably combine this with something like signing, right? You can have like, uh, the FD, uh, like as Andre mentioned, you can have this combined with a LSM layered policy, which says if you have an FD, you can uh, load sign program, something that is uh, trusted or that is signed by a key that is trusted by the container manager or or some level of provenance in the container stack. This could be the container manager the, in the in the in, or the kernel or some build server somewhere else. So you can use this in conjunction with it. Just gives the a bit of an easy loading semantic from within the container that you don't have to. Uh, go to through some root daemon to have your loading done. You can have the FD and have the token from that there and then have load just signed programs. You can build a more complex policy on top as of this as well. Hello, KP. <laughs> Hello, Christian. <laughs> yeah, so that, that's something that like I kind of anticipate and that's why I have this like user context, right? That user context could be like arbitrary user defined set of filters or permissions, right, that will be enforced by BPF LSM on top. And BPF LSM will have like direct access to this uh, this array of bytes. I have a slightly tangential question, Andre. Had this discussion about authoritative LSMs gone the way you wanted, 
uh, no. <laughs> would would Clearly. would you would you have still preferred the the semantic with the token stuff, right? I I, I don't want like uninformed or sort of opinions to dictate technical decisions. So had this discussion been that hey we can have authorized. Uh, uh, LS, like authority or like LSM being more al on an allow path and not just on the restricted path, would you prefer that approach or would you still prefer this one? It, it feels to me that uh, BPF token approach is actually more flexible and more uh, convenient in practice actually. So yeah, I would probably still prefer the token. I just didn't think about this initially. I, I agree with this. I think what it does is and, that And I'll get to the next to slide and explain kind of like why. <laughs> Okay, okay, then we, we shut up and we wait for your next slide. Go. So uh, what I was wondering about, uh, like, you, you, the, the token thing is only about access, right? It's not about anything else, right? Like, because usually what I realize is when this model shows up, what you actually want is a session, right? Like, because let's say you have a container that has access to certain BPF functionality and then you shut down the container, you probably want to destroy a good chunk of that. Isn't the model that you're looking for really that you want a BPF session that you but that's effectively what it is, right? Like, so if you have sysfs in uh, sorry bpffs instance mounted just for the container, when that container is shut down, that bpffs will be unmounted, right? And like token will be gone. Basically. Okay, but then the question is, why do you need a token and a, and this instance? Isn't the instance then enough that you bind everything back to the instance of the bpffs? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Mike. Okay, maybe I'm wrong on that. Uh, but, um, uh, I mean, like you would have to not have another way of saying, please ignore, please, please don't do ca uh, capable uh, cap um, cap BPF because um, you you can't just have a check of me saying like, oh, do you have this mount in your mount tree? Because there are many issues that you you can uncover with that. Like for instance, for instance, for containers in, I don't know if currently Docker slash whatever, um, whether we. Uh, use the hosts slash uh, BPF mount from sys because we actually copy the host one and make it read only, um, uh, except for the ones that we don't that are like special because because not because most of sys is not namespace so you can't just mount a new sys you need to copy the host one for instance, um, so you so a check like that wouldn't work. I, I mean the the. I would assume, like, we have uh, file systems like this before, like devtempfs, for example, uh, uh, what's called devpts. Um, basically, every container gets, by the container manager, mounted a new instance um, that basically gives them control over own their own stuff. This sounds to me as if the container manager, if it wants to allow access to BPF, should just mount its own instance of BPFFS into it. That is a privileged thing that enables the, uh, that then it can open that up via whatever it wants like access mode and things like that, and then when you go away, you destroy it so that your token, your token's a file descriptor anyway, could just be the, the, the reference to this BPFFS. You don't even have to mount it, you can just but leave it as a script block in memory. Maybe I'm misunderstanding, but that's exactly what we are proposing here. That like you have the BPFFS instance and then you pin the token. Because like, but why is doesn't it even different have to be thing? That's, that's my question. Like, why is it a different thing? Why don't you just take the file descriptor to the BPFFS as the thing that gives you access? Because if you have access to the BPFFS, you have access to the BPFFS. And like, what I'm the only thing that I'm not getting is like, why do you need two things? Um, isn't this shouldn't this be the, the the same thing that everything? If you're allowed to create something, it also implies a life cycle. That's all I'm basically want because the the BPFFS gives you a life cycle. This token thing, as far as I understood, does not. That's all I'm saying. If I don't know if that makes any sense, what I'm saying. <laughs> Joe? So I if a single container ever needed two tokens, right, then the life cycling of having separate tokens and being able to mount, like, hey, if this of this, whatever, you know, token one, token two, and then somehow, like, whether it's to do with the secret hierarchy and there's like two containers in the same, you know, group Even or file whatever else, right? Can just so it if it's like that, then having identity of individual tokens under that file system would be helpful versus like, I think what you're proposing is basically the file system itself acts as that token. Mm. Yeah, so this one is just more flexible, but basically you can do, like with this setup, you can do what you propose, like where it's one file per file system. You you can also do away without BPFFS at all. Like you can just transfer the file descriptor through like Unix domain socket, for example. Or you can have multiple per per each container, and then like maybe restricted based on LSM or file permissions or both <laughs> stuff like this. So it just 
more generic, I guess. Maybe maybe I'm misunderstanding actually what you're proposing. Sorry. What? I have a question about the about the token pinning that you said before. So, but I mean, you can have as many BPFFs as you want, right? Like, and you can nowadays just allocate a super block like via the new mount APIs, and then you have a file descriptor for that. All I'm suggesting is that make the API so that uh, somebody allocates a BPFFs super block, f like something more privileged than you allocates a super block for you. Just hand it down to to your container, whoever shall have that, and that is everything that that they need to get access which basically means you merge the two concepts of having a BPFFS that is uh, capable of pinning things, is capable of enumerating things, and the access, because it's just one file descriptor at that point. Because but if you have a file descriptor to the BPFFS, okay. it basically means, yeah. Okay, so sorry, you're suggesting sorry. coupling the token and uh, BPFFS, is it right? Uh, yeah, well, I mean, coupling, I would just make them one. Yeah, That's but, but doesn't that, like, so there are use cases where you want BPFFS, but you don't want token, for example. But then, like for example, how would you grant different permissions for BPF for different applications inside that container? Then you would just give it one. Oh, so I don't know what currently. How does BPF uh, FS currently work? I think what you're uh, you're uh, assuming is that each BPF mount is a separate super block. It is. Yeah. Well, then it would work probably. I mean, and then, and then of course the next thing would be to uh, set a mask of things that you can actually do with a BPFS on this thing. But this is what you're describing basically is, is the concept of, of, of like the real capabilities, not the Linux style capabilities, where you have an object, you pin it, you have permissions on it, and then the object goes away once you give up all the file descriptors, which is actually a model that you implemented in most of the b BPF concepts already. So uh, all I'm just saying is I think you don't need the token, just use the BPFS, may pluralize that if you so will. Um, and use that as a primary s way because that's your context object. That's that's everything you already have is bound to that thing because it's pinning and, and things like that. Make it the proper concept object, uh, context object. No. So I don't know if I understand it correctly. So back to the slides where Andrew showed that you have other kind of uh, permission you want to give. For example, you want to control which uh, helper functions you can access or which memories that can also access. And that one cannot be tied to the, op the file system interface. Now you can use a token to, you can. So, like, are you suggesting that mount options would be used to associate arbitrary metadata with that instance of BPFFS? Because I think that the thing is that in the LSM, you want to know which instance is being opened. Um, and also, you don't want every instance of BPFFS to have this capability token. There's definitely use cases where we want to mount BPFFS and expose maps and don't want the user to have BPF access. Isn't uh, maybe I'm maybe misremembering, but is there not a mount block on the host that everyone can access, or, or is it? Oh, it's root only. Okay, okay. I guess that answers the other question I was going to have, which is that about this um, about um being able to grab the um, um because because you say that you you know it's because the way the pinning works, you have to do an IOCTL to get the pin, but but um uh you, the implication, sorry, yeah, the implication of getting the pin as an unprivileged user means that an unprivileged user needs to be able to do that, and the question is is uh how is that going to be yeah, sorry for this one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, b so when an unprivileged process does BPF object get blah blah blah, um, what permission check is being done there? Is my question, I guess. File I permissions, I think, right now. Okay. Okay. So I, I guess I agree that there is like equivalence in some sense that like if you are okay with like ten different instances of SysFS per uh, per container, then like yes, you could implement it, but it seems like less flexible still and just like generally more messy solution because BPFFS is also used to like to share maps with it, like let's say within the container or within the host, right? Like you can pin the map and then like multiple different applications will will expect that this map will be pinned in one specific location, then you'll open it and like you'll share it, right? That's like intentional that you want one instance of uh, BPFFS for sharing, right? So like coupling that with like this token like uh, uh, model is just, yes, it might work. It seems like less flexible. 
for no good reason. Uh, um, I want to voice that uh, I disagree with the Dev PTS example. Like Dev PTS is not the same thing. Like it's it's a completely different problem. I I, I don't yeah I I don't I don't think there's any other like case where you would have like this much permission access due to having like a weird mount point thing. But that's just my opinion. <laughs> Sorry, uh, follow up question. Like, is there a benefit to making BPFFS the same as the token? As in, like, what you can do, your approach is like BPFFS is the token, or like have that be a separate thing. Is it like a meaningful thing, like where, where this is? Okay. I mean, not to speak for you, but I, I assume what your point is is that you can always add an extra layer of complexity, but there should be a reason for it. I mean, the, the thing is, like, I have a suspicion when you when you delegate stuff. I mean, we have delegation of, of all kinds of resources, like C groups, whatever else, and they they binding that to file system. Like, if you have have to do this anyway, it's kind of nice, in a way. And then I don't know. It's like it's it's to me it's a simplicity because you're pinning ultimately the the same object there. You just different ways to get there, like one, uh, you, you just focus on the sec security aspect about the authentication aspect, and the other way, uh, way you just focus on enumeration and list, uh, things like that, I think it would be a vastly simpler model if it was just the same thing, because usually if you have access to something, um, like uh, th this implies pinning, and if you have a p some object pinned, then it, this also should probably have some access that you have on it uh, controlled. I don't know, but the, yeah, I, I can totally understand if it's hard to follow what I'm actually trying to say here. But uh, it's we, sh we should probably take it online, like into the <laughs> whole uh, discussion, and just like try to get to the details. The the only problem that I really see is with this. Um, I, I, by the way, I applaud your uh, persistence on solving this issue because I think this is it's a legitimate request and. Uh, the LSM thingy I found kind of weird as well, but uh, in, in general, I don't see something specifically wrong with this. The only thing that bothers me is it's like a orthogonal delegation mechanism to all of the namespace hierarchy, which is which is fine, but the, the problem usually is, and that's an advantage of doing it your way, uh, is you tie into the namespace uh, delegation hierarchy because you have the file system you mounted, it's bound to the mount namespace, which is owned by the user namespace, and it's tied to the lifecycle of the user namespace. Whereas if you build a separate model, all of the delegation is completely orthogonal, which m makes it much more risky in the long run, uh, having security issues, which is my only concern, which is vague, arguably. Uh, it's, I'm sorry to long so long to remember this. Um, I'm pretty sure you can actually just open like sysfs bpf as an, even as a privileged user. You can open a, a handle to it. You can't do anything with it. You can't look underneath it. But like, if you open an o path, it'll let you. I'm pretty sure. But like, what? But like, how would that? I mean, I mean, um, I mean, it has the right thing. I mean, o path does slightly more than that. I would, I wouldn't say it does nothing. I mean, there's lots of really awful, awful stuff you can do with o path. Like, I'm. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm. Yeah, I'm. I'm a master of doing awful shit with OPath. <laughs> Still, I mean, um, of course, if if you pass this this file descriptor to the to the main uh, file system object to the BPF system call, it should check that it's not an OPath file descriptor, but a real one. So that basically means, yeah, you actually really had the the right to uh, to open this, right? Like this is. Yeah, but you, you um, I have to take my laptop to double. I have to take my laptop to double check, but I. Uh, I don't know if you need. Do you know if you try to open like a directory that you don't have write access to or read access to? Can you just open a handle to it? You can with. Uh, sorry, uh, we'll have to just later. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, keep going. Sorry. <laughs> I mean, no, I, to I give have a little a bit of background, regarding. like how how we do 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 things in in a, a user space these day, like and systemly, like for for service management, we usually um, like when we start a daemon, like the model that we try to follow is, like we give them lots of their own private file systems, right? Like they get their own private uh, subdirectory and slash run, which is just a tempfs um, instance. We do this model, uh, like it get might get a DFPTS, it might get a couple of other things, like private file systems that belong to them that only exist in their namespaces and things like that. For me, it would appear very natural, like uh, like this is, an, like for us, it makes a lot of sense, this model, um, that for the BPF thing is the same thing, right? Like you tell systemd, hey, give this instance um, a and its own instance of BPFFS, maybe with some security attributes that would have to be configured, and that's all that happens. And it's actually a, a that's then handed in via file descriptor or even um, mounted into the namespace if that's that's being used. But that's 
Yeah. This is just to, 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 to illustrate what the background is that we have there. Because uh, what you're basically saying with the token is then we would have to do, do two things, right? Like we would for first of all mount the file system instance in there, but then secondly also allocate like a bunch of tokens that we have to uh, pass in through some other yeah. mechanism, right? And then you, you just want to like, why did I just do this? Um, I so I actually see like that as a benefit that like they are talking about uh, BPFFS and the tokens because you can actually recreate the token if you updated some global configuration without restarting the container. You can change like this user context and like start allowing or disallowing some like operation, right? We don't have that like in this initial design. Like we don't have like the tunable like what can be done using this token, right? But eventually we'll have more, right? Like we'll have how many uh, instructions, like maximum instructions is allowed, right? Or like which program types should be loadable under this token, right? And like having the token, you can actually... BFFS. Yeah, why aren't those, yeah, that's the thing. You, if you have like uh, in the new mount API, for example... Uh, so you're saying like why it's not part of the BPFFS like uh, yeah. mount option? If you have some uh, some uh, container like some application that already pinned maps, right? They want this map to be preserved. Like so, when you remount, like wouldn't those pinned maps be unpinned, basically? No. Like, yeah. Okay. That's as the super block uh, oh. survives. All right. I mean, also if you don't like <laughs> mount <laughs> options, totally fine. Make it some attribute files or something weird like this if you want to. But uh, honestly, I think mount options would just work fine. Uh, I have KP? a question. Yeah. I have a Go. question. Uh, how do you, even now we can have VPFFS in containers, right? How would I differentiate when this is acting as a privileged token uh, for like, as a, uh, like it rep represent this cap PPF privilege and when it is not, how would I differentiate it as a user of a container? Whereas this, this token based approach which, where it appears as a file descriptor and I can do a BPF operation on it to get access to privileged context is very, very clear. Uh, in this scenario, it just ends up being a confused, confused case where I have to look at some attribute of that file system. No, no, as in like we already. So I guess to, to rephrase the KP, So basically, um, you would have because we already have uh, the the BPF file system in, in containers. So we already have that. So if you were to add this feature that this now allows you to get extra permissions, then you would. It would be a mount option. Uh, it would need to be an opt-in, right? It would be like you have an amount option which says like delegate or allow. Yeah, yeah, but what's yeah. what's the what's the problem? You can't magically upgrade uh, your running containers to use unprivileged eBPF anyway. Yeah, but you could have existing configs <laughs> and existing clusters that have existing configs where yada yada without knowing. The, the idea would be if you don't specify a mount option, you get the same behavior as you always did. If you specify mount option, hey, this is a BPFS with magic uh, delegation uh, capabilities, then suddenly you can do a little bit more than this. Yeah. And then you can add mount options as much as you want. But it doesn't really have to be mount options, but mm -hmm. somehow you want to catch it to the, to the file but system. As, as a user, if it, that is running within a container, how do I know that this PPFFS that I've gotten in you, my you, container is you, something that is privileged and something that is not? Um, I, I'm, I'm like, my recommendation would always just execute and see what happens. But if you want, like, I mean, if BPF wants to have an API to query this, it's not, not a problem. You can make it an You can just read it from the mount options. Uh, like, like a million ways how you can communicate the information. You can make it a new BPF uh, call um, where you pass into the system call, like the file descriptor to the file system, and then it re responds to you. I mean, this figure something out. And if you do it, uh, if you extend it, for example, via mount, app, uh, via mount options, it, it might, uh, systemd could mount it for you, like could prepare it. The container manager would be need to be privileged in this case. Uh, but then you could, for example, check for this mount option, you need capsys admin. For this uh, mount option, you need capnet admin. For this nat mount option, you need this and that. Yeah, I'm so I mean, they are kind of equivalent, right? Yeah. Except the token is a little bit more flexible because you can have multiple per file system and uh, multiple file systems, some with tokens, some not. So basically, they are equivalent. Yes, like you can achieve probably the same with like slightly different manipulations, but ultimately, whoever is like deciding like has to be privileged and like say allowed or not allowed, right? And then within the container, the application will be able to query it by based on like file existence or like some extra command or some query and stuff like this, right? So, um, last comment, okay, uh, <coughs> hopefully it's a good one. Um, if, if BPFFS becomes a token, then that would give us also a nice and easy way to migrate existing applications into like user namespace. So that's my next slide. Ah, <laughs> I see, aha, good. I'll I would like to get client. to it. <laughs> uh, 
So, so yeah, so like the, the last slide I had, right, like assuming this is file and all that stuff, like I wanted to propose besides, you know, like the mechanism itself doesn't anticipate like specific use case and that's what I actually like about it. It's like orthogonal to like file systems, like it doesn't have to be pinned, it can be like just transferred as the file descriptor, right? But eventually like to make it easier for existing applications to take advantage of that, right, we would have to agree on some sort of a predefined like standard location, which doesn't have to be that, like it could be overridden, but by default, we can teach libpf, any other bpf loader uh, library, bpf trace, bpf tool, anyone who's who's having like deeper bpf usage, right? Bpf is called usage, to just expect the file like at fixed location. Like in this case, I propose like sysfs bpf dot token, but you know, just just as an uh, illustration. And uh, for example, from libpf uh, standpoint, like when it creates the bpf object and tries to load all the programs, right? It can check whether this token exists, try to open it, and if it succeeds, then like it will provide this token FD automatically, like and transparently to uh, to like the user itself with like every load operation. Yeah. One final point, but that means recompiling. But that means recompiling your application for yes. this to work, right? So if we had the BPFFS approach, we could have the kernel say, oh, this is in a namespace, does it have the mount, and then... I, the I don't understand like how existence of the BPFFS in the container allows application that doesn't know or doesn't use BPFFS to suddenly get unprivileged BPF. Like, I, I just No, no, this is like an additional thing, but like if that was the... the you but like, imagine the situation. You have yeah. like container, it has BPFFS mounted by systemd or something. Yep. And I have application that doesn't care about BPFFS. Yeah. Like I never pinned anything, I never loaded from a BPFFS. Yes. Would the existence of this BPFFS in the container somehow magically allow me to, to do the unprivileged BPF? I think it should. Like kernel yeah. would just check that like there is yeah. some mount. Okay. It checks the current mount namespace or whatever. That seems like very m magical, I guess. I mean, it's all so kind of magical, so I don't know. Well, uh, I, would, I would caution against doing it that way, um, just because we had, I mean, there isn't a specific issue that I can think of, but like we, um, I um, now that they're gone, I can say my opinion. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, like I think that the idea of using the file system is if you if you hold the a, a, f a handle to the file system, you basically replace the token idea with just that file system. That was the proposal, uh, which, whatever, that makes some sense. I don't fully agree with the justification, but whatever. But the the point is, is that um, if you were to then say, well, no, 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 if you have any mount whatsoever in your mount, mount namespace, that gives you extra permissions. Uh, that, in my opinion, is it would be a bad idea. You wouldn't want to do it that way. Uh, first of all, because you could suddenly have programs that have more privileges than they used to without having any way of like knowing it originally. And the other thing is, is that you have, um, like the way that we talk about like what mounts are in a mount namespace and everything else, that's like a whole other kettle of fish. Like technically, like what is a container? Like you can get like very philosophical with this discussion in about like three seconds. So I would say uh, don't touch any of that. <laughs> it's, it, you have to hold a thing that you are then dealing with. It'd be my suggestion. Yeah. And so all programs, they can deal with it by restarting them with a new library. So you're whatever. basically saying that this makes sense to you. Uh, I mean, I, I I could go either way with either proposal. I don't know. Uh, but yeah, that's, yeah. It, it seems all right to me, yeah. All right. Yeah, and like, so right. basically by, by having some sort of like an ecosystem, just two, two okay. words, by having ecosystem-wide kind of agreement that like in typical situation, if this special dot .token file exists, then like libraries and tools will take advantage of that to, to bypass like root, root permission requirements basically. Right, and then like it will be on system D and like whatever solutions to either grant this token and pin it and expose it or not. That that's all I had. Thank you. It was uh, really. I, I think nice one more discussion. one more thing, Thank Andre, you can mention from a <laughs> security. No, no, no. We have to cut off. I'm sorry. We have to take this to the hallway, or like we have to do another office yes, or KP, okay. come to the hallway. Um, <laughs> okay, I'll see you. I'll take a flight and be there in five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you. KP, just just message offline. We can talk about that. Thank you. Or you can say it now while Jiri is preparing his laptop. That's also fine if it's okay. just one comment. Good. That's just one comment. I think oh, one, one good uh, aspect of the token approach is that you can create multiple contexts. And if something needs a privileged operation just for reading or for, or, for a limited context, like a tool that is an uh, introspectability tool to for BPF management, it can use a token that is created for a smaller sort of context in mind than like something that has a larger context. So you can create multiple contexts rather than exposing everything via BPFFS. So I still sort of prefer the context-based, uh, uh, token-based approach. 
All right, thank you. Okay, are you good? Oh.